Hi, welcome to part four of four of the uh, lectures on learning codes, taking subjectivity into account. The last three talks were all about um, codes critique of uh, value neutral science and uh, apolitical epistemology, building up toward um, her positive proposal. So that's what we're gonna do today. And that means, um, what does she think we should be doing instead of what we have been doing in the classical epistemology tra tradition, in the sort of post-positivist philosophy of science, uh, value neutral science tradition. So that's what we're talking about today. Um, so Coates says that the crux of her argument is that there's no such thing, or that the, that the sorry, that the disinterested observer, the one who can be value neutral and act as if politics don't matter, is the exception rather than the rule. And so, uh, generically speaking then, the um, right way to assess knowledge claims or to investigate scientific claims or to do science, to do epistemology, is to be aware of and be conscientious of and inter interpret in light of um, political, social identity factors, um, things like gender, race, uh, class, ability status, you know, stuff like this. It's not that there's never ever a time when um, politics doesn't come into the thing. So she recognizes that, like, it might be the case that for some simple, some simple uh, cases, like there's a, a shrub next to me, we don't have to take into account um, politics. Her main complaint is that the focus of epistemology has been on things like here's a hand or there's a tree or whatever, the stuff I've been talking about. And those are, for the most part, apolitical claims. Um, her complaint is that by focusing on those and making those the paradigm cases of knowledge, like, like Moore says, like, if there's anything that counts as knowledge, it's that I know that I have a hand here. Well, that's pretty apolitical. I mean, it doesn't really matter. In that case, really, politics don't matter. Like, it doesn't, my social identity doesn't come into it. The existence of ideologies that support oppressive social hierarchies doesn't come into the question of whether or not I have a hand. So when we make that, when we make those kind of claims about knowledge, the paradigm, we focus the whole inquiry, the whole field of epistemology focuses on apolitical things. Um, when those are the paradigm cases, then the political stuff seems really complex and sort of, you have to build up to it. Start, you start with like knowledge of your own mental states or something. And the political cases are like uh, much more um, strange, uh, complicated cases. So see, when you start off from the Cartesian point of view, it's not that you could never get to um, politics in theory, but in practice you just never do. There's always more foundational questions to be asked. What's a belief? What's justification? You spend 40 or 50 years on that stuff and you never license yourself to address the more complicated political questions like how do how does gender uh how does a person's gender affect what they can know so from Coates' perspective what we need to do is shift the paradigm cases um, of knowledge the ones that are the sort of quintessential examples that we want to focus on as a field if we shift to politically relevant to ones where politics is relevant then we start to develop theories of knowledge that are sensitive to social and political factors. Um, there's no clouds out today. It's really blue sky out. It's perfect for the, the blue screen tricks I've been doing. I've been trying playing a lot, a lot with this chroma key. Let's see. So that's the first recommendation she makes. She says we have to stop focusing on these cases um, where politics doesn't matter and refocus on uh, the cases where politics does matter. And that should be like the sort of um, primary interest. That's what should be where epistemology is focused. Insofar as epistemology focuses on this other stuff that's apolitical, it's misleading, and it serves the interests of people who don't need to care about politics. Um, and that means the dominant group. So the dominant group is the group that can uh, ignore the existence of gender because their gender doesn't matter, male. Um, it, it's only when women start doing it that the gender sort of matters. And then her complaint from that we talked about earlier is that the as soon as the feminist wants to bring, sorry, bring gender into epistemology, 
the sort of dominant ideology says that's not relevant. If you're doing, if you're talking about that, you're not really talking about epistemology. You're not talking about something that's general enough. But the feminist is saying, but I'm noticing that gender does matter in many ways. And if we're defining the discipline in terms of the kinds of knowledge claims where politics or gender doesn't matter, then you're basically telling me that I'm not allowed to use epistemology to in, to investigate gender-based oppression or to explain how knowledge is relevant in the context of gender-based oppression, similarly for race and ability class. Um, the other thing that she says we have to do, which is sort of part and parcel with this, uh, the other side of the coin, is that in cases where the um, presumption is that the um, data or the conclusions or the epistemology, the the theory, whatever it might be, where the presumption seems to be that it's um, apolitical, value neutral, we need to be um, investigating those things through, like, with a critical lens. And what that means is, um, if there's a scientific theory that uh, basically, really, she thinks any science is is ripe for this kind of thing, it should be viewed under a critical race theory lens or a critical feminist lens. Um, and uh, the, the idea, and I'll, I'll try to go into this in a little bit more detail, but the idea is that if we don't look at it critically, then we're just inviting ourselves to be biased. And that the best way to avoid bias is to look critically through these critical, various critical lenses. Um, so it's really, so the, the aim according to code um, and later, Sheeman, um, another author who said, talks about this is uh, Sandra Harding. Um, these people say, you know, being, bringing politics into science is actually a way to get more objectivity. It's not that like you're going to become more biased by importing politics. The idea is, if you don't look at the political side of it, then you're in, then you're going to be biased. It's not that you can ever totally avoid the bias of your own politics and your own view of reality. But the worry is, if you pretend like you can be, then you're not even acknowledging that your work is or could be subjected to sort of these, these biases. So the best way to obtain more objectivity, maybe not total objectivity, but the best we can do is to um, view everything with an eye toward how it's connected up with so social reality and politics. can't stop noticing how good this guy is for for chroma key today that's where you replace one color uh, with like some video like this stuff <laughs> um, okay so that's what I, I just want to go into some of the details about how she says we should do that what does it mean to shift the paradigm case of knowledge for example um, and what should the paradigm be um, and then say a little bit more about how we're supposed to be uh, engaging with science uh, in, in a critical way. Okay, so like I mentioned before, the sort of paradigm cases, uh, here's a hand. Um, epistemologists like to use examples like there's a cat on the mat, stuff you can see very directly. Um, or just as, as common, um, or things like, I think I have in the slides like, the Geiger counter is pointing to such and such number or whatever. Just uh, you know, looking at scientific instruments and ascertaining what they say. Those are the paradigm cases coming from positivism again of like what a, a really good um, observation looks like, and that's the basis of knowledge. So to shift the paradigm case is to take other kinds of examples as paradigmatic. So what code suggests is. Um, choosing personal relationships or, or um, the sort of judgments we make about one another in relationships. Her example, I don't think is the absolute best, but she says like Alice is clever. That's a kind of statement of an observation that you could make. It's not the most straightforward, here's a hand type observation. It has all kinds of interpersonal factors. It builds in your relationship with this person, your own subjective opinions, about what cleverness amounts to and what's required for it. So if that's the sort of fundamental, quintessential maybe I should say, um, epistemological state, observing that someone's clever, there's a lot that gets built into that kind of thing. Um, 
in terms of, yeah, interpersonal relationships. So maybe a better example, I think maybe would be something like, um, like so-and-so is untrustworthy or so-and-so is a jerk. So-and-so is, uh, um, you know, the sort of like politically fraught judgments that we make about each other, <laughs> about their character, um, the, sort of the more ethically loaded ones. I feel like the cleverness example isn't, isn't perfect because it doesn't even really get to the heart of the issue about uh, how much politics is and uh, personal ethical standards and um, background views about this, this sort of the state of the society, who's oppressed, um, who is an oppressor. Uh, these sorts of judgments go into, um, I think, if you pick your paradigm case to be one that incorporates that kind of judgment, all that complex, politically laden stuff, that's really, I think, what she's getting, what Code is getting at. That would be a better example of how she's thinking we should be uh, doing epistemology. I'm really liking this halo effect. <laughs> um, so the features that Code says pop out when you think about this type of example is that like knowing somebody in a relationship, it's always a process of learning. It's always in flux. Your opinion is always changing. I think you could also add even your opinion about the past, about what an interaction meant or what a person was thinking or what they meant, what their evaluative status, like judgments of the person. That stuff can change um, as the as the present unfolds. Um, she says also that knowledge of a person admits of like degrees. Um, in a way that knowledge that this book is read, I think it's her example, doesn't. Um, also, when you think about judgments of other people, uh, a, a constant feature of that is that there's always m multiple perspectives and different people can have different opinions and different people in different relationships have different ideas about what a person's like or, or who they are as a person. Um, so she calls it multi-perspectival, multi-dimensional. Um, it's not straightforward and it's never fully settled. Um, so just to, to, to tap back into the contrast, the um, standard, like here's a hand, that's settled. I mean, that's why it was strikingly interesting for that kind of epistemologist to pick that, because it doesn't admit of interpret, there's no, there's no interpretation that goes into it. It doesn't really matter who you are. You're going to have the same opinions. Um, there's no relationships involved. There's no politics involved. So Code asks, you know, why is that standard, this objective, unobjectionable, uh, apolitical, value neutral, here's a hand type uh, uh, case? Why is that the paradigm? Why shouldn't it be something else? I think there is a kind of answer to that. I mean, it's because in part we want observation. I mean, one hope is that like empirical observation will help us settle political disputes. So we should be sort of basing our, um, our debates on the facts meaning like the stuff that's that's uncontroversial but her reply to that is also i think really important to notice she's like this is a very minuscule part of reality um it's such a small fragment of the things that we actually know or take ourselves to know or take to be important that they be unobjectionable value neutral a perspectival ob objective in that way so one way you can put it is that i think you're resting your hopes on this sort of unlikely, uh, maybe from her perspective anyway, it's unlikely that you're gonna find enough of this <laughs> objectivity um, to settle political questions anyway. Um, and most of the stuff that we're interested in is steeped in politics. And I think that, again, going back to something I said in the first lecture, this, this is stuff that we're noticing, I think, socially all over the place. It's like politics is connected to everything. It's very hard to find an issue that people agree about, even when it comes to scientific issues like medical science, climate change science, you know, epidemiology. There's differences and they're predictable on the basis of political alignment, gender, race, this stuff is all implicated in what people take to be true. Um, and now that you might still hold out hope and you say, no, damn it, that, that's just, there, there are these factors that people are ignoring at the objective truths. 
And if everyone would just pay attention to the objective truths, um, we would get the right answers and people would be in agreement and they would be rational objectively and um, politics would be excised from epistemology and science again. So I'm not sort of sure what to say about this, where I come down on this argument, but I just wanted to try to put the two sides out there. It's actually really warm. Okay, so that's kind of all I'm gonna say about shifting the paradigm to um, cases that are politically uh, involved. Um, the second thing I wanna talk about is how to do this interpretive critical work, what she suggests about that. All this stuff is pretty preliminary. In a way, this is like at the very beginning of, you know, it's in the early 80s, um, discussion about how this stuff is supposed to work. At the beginning of the science wars, what they call the science wars. So a lot of these ideas, excuse me, a lot of these ideas have been developed in more detail in the last 30 years, 40 years, whatever it is now. Okay, so she, su she, she suggests the general principle that uh, knowledge is always um, imbricated with social relationships, and so social issues, politics, social identity, um, culture, um, these things are always relevant to knowledge. I think the best way to read it as, is as gen a generic claim. Like, it should be the default at least. Um, she already admits that like the cats on the mat isn't necessarily something that's useful to do a political analysis of. That's why it's useful for the people, according to her, it's useful for people who don't want political analyses to be done to focus epistemology on those cases. So since generically, uh, social factors are always relevant in the production of knowledge, therefore um, social factors should always be analyzed um, or taken into consideration when assessing knowledge claims. And what kind of factors are we talking about here? Things like social identities of the investigator, of the person who's formulating the theory, um, uh, structures of oppression like racism, sexism, homophobia, um, implicit biases, the possibility of implicit bias, and like ideologies or the existence of uh, sets of ideas, traditions, cultural uh, patterns of thought, patterns in education. Um, even assessing what is an ideology and what's not though is obviously politically loaded. It's not politically neutral to say what's ideological in the sense of what is supporting the prevailing structures of oppression and what's not. It depends in part on what you think the structures of oppression are, and that's a politically loaded question. People are going to disagree about it along political lines. And then the idea is that uh, these things, these social factors are relevant when assessing arguments, uh, evidence, observations, theories, um, what counts as intuitive or commonsensical, the commonsensical to who? There's this, there's this constant, just to go back to the first or second lecture or whatever it was, the idea of we saying is, you know, that's implicated in this idea of what's common sense or what do we all uh, take to be obvious. Anything that seems obvious, and if that's, if that's a part of your argument that something is obvious or that something's interesting, you know, those things are very sensitive to the identity of the person who's claiming it. And, you know, it, it works as long as the people you're talking to have the same perspective or the same share the same identity. Okay, last, I just want to talk about um, a few objections to the picture that basically said everything I'm going to say about um, what she thinks we should do. Now I just want to address some obje objections. I always think that the, one of the best ways to understand things in philosophy is to try to understand the objections to it. So even if you are a big fan of this picture, it's really useful to think about objections to it, to try to articulate in your own mind what, what you're trying to say or what you believe. So first objection is how far does this get generalized. There might be some good cases for where, where code seems to be right, but also maybe there are some other cases where it's not so obvious, like in the so-called hard sciences, like chemistry or physics. Like, do you need to bring politics into physics to figure out whether or not, you know, quantum gravity theory A is right? I mean, it seems like that's not really uh, a domain of inquiry where this is relevant. Now, I don't entirely know if that if I believe that. So, for one example that I've talked about before, um, like take the Large Hadron Collider, um, constructed 
to find the Higgs boson, among other things, but that was like one of the main objectives. And, you know, it was the most expensive machine ever built. So there's a lot of politics that goes into building the most expensive machine ever built. That thing had better find something interesting <laughs> or else it was a waste, that's the kind of thought. But I, I think you could have predicted they were gonna find the Higgs boson. It might not have had all the same properties that they were predicting, but it would have been, they would have found something, anything close enough. They would have been like, oh, this is the Higgs boson. It just isn't exactly the same, the thing that we thought it was gonna be. It has some slightly different mass, slightly different properties, different spin, who knows. Um, but the point is that politics could influence, I think, uh, the course of physical theory. She also sort of ironically, jokingly says, what are we supposed to be friends with chairs and dog? Well, you can be friends with dogs. Uh, friends with trees in order to know them. I mean, I think she's really being ironical in this passage where she says this stuff about being friends with trees as if um, it's silly to think, it's an objection to the view to think that we need to treat trees as uh, something that we have to be in a relationship with to know about them. Um, I think that there's a couple ways to respond to that. I think her way is saying, yeah, I'm not talking about that kind of thing. I really don't care as much about the tree thing. Maybe that's a kind of objective science relationship. But I also think you could go the other way and say, no, there are relationship issues <laughs> with nature, broadly speaking. Our relationship with nature, non-metaphorically, has some bearing on our scientific uh, theory. And treating trees as things that we can't be in any kind of, you know, personal relationship with. I mean, that's part and parcel with a lot of scientific theory. I mean, you'd be pretty weird to be a scientist who also says we are, you know, in personal relationship with the trees, but it's not like there are no such scientists. Um, there's this guy named George Cajete. He's an indigenous science person. He's interested in biology, but also has, brings this indigenous perspective of like being in relationship with, you know, non-human animals and, and even plants and stuff. So maybe it's irrational. Maybe calling it irrational though is part of the politics of doing the science. That's the kind of thing that Code's critique lets you say. So I don't know if Code herself would go for that, but it's something that that's like part of her analysis. At least it's made available there. Okay, last objection, then we'll be done with Code. Um, although, like I said, we're going to return to these themes in the next two readings. readings. Um, so the last objection is something like, okay, if code is right, then practically everything is steeped in politics, but how are we supposed to salvage anything like objectivity then? Is objectivity just doomed? I think there's sort of two, two or three responses to this uh, worry. The worry is, um, if, if code is right, then there's no such thing as objectivity or something like that. One way of, of saying it is, uh, one thing that I think is right, is um, there, just because we don't have uh, any means of reaching a consensus about objective reality doesn't mean that there is no objective reality. We might be in the unfortunate political circumstance where we can't get ourselves as a society to agree about what's going on, but that doesn't mean there isn't a fact of the matter. Reality and, and human beliefs are different things. Um, so even if she's right and we cannot have a notion of objectivity that helps guide our inquiries because for some reason we're so steeped in politics that that notion is useless or is itself politically charged or something, that doesn't mean there's no reality out there. Another response is kind of works in the same, I mean, it's, it's consistent with the thing I just said, but um, you know, we might not be in a position. So the person who really wants objectivity in the picture wants a notion of objectivity, a concept of objectivity, to help us in our disputes. We want to be able to appeal to what's objectively true in order to settle disputes. But it might just turn out that that's just not going to work. Like, it's not Code's fault. You see it happening all over the place anyway. Like, it's appeals to objectivity don't really help settle political disputes. And if everything from climate change science to epidemiology to nutrition, metaphysics, I mean, everything is politically loaded, then objectivity is not gonna, I mean, the concept of objectivity is not gonna help settle disputes very often. So that might just be something we have to live with or figure out a way to deal with. F 
figure out our best approach to dealing with the problem pragmatically. I don't know what to do. And the third response, of course, is to deny that code is right and try to show that somehow or other there are objective guides to reality, objective guidelines that we can um, convince everyone to follow. And, um, you know, maybe the bad eggs will stop making trouble for rationality and truth and we'll get back to a uh, life where everyone has a shared vision of reality that transcends politics. I don't know if we've ever been there before. Um, it seems to me like possibly part of the problem is that like uh, it's the, the inclusion of more voices in the dispute and in the discussion that has actually troubled the sense of a consensus reality. Where if you have like the dominant ideology and the dominant structure is strong enough that the only voices that are being heard that have any political influence all agree with each other, then it seems like um, objective reality is pretty settled. But as soon as you have a wide variety of political opinions in the mix, then you get to this point where it's like, okay, are we going to get everyone to agree? <laughs> but nevertheless, the third possibility is it's sort of practical and it's also theoretical. It's like saying there is a way forward to get everyone to agree on the same set of uh, objective value neutral concepts or something like that in science and epistemology and that somehow um, this set of principles will be objectively binding on anyone who's rational. And so everyone will sort of eventually come around to see that it's right. Now you can already hear, I don't know if you can <laughs> sense this, but like the code response is like, you call this the uh, consensus that anyone who's rational will reach and it probably is your view. <laughs> so again, you're back in this position of saying, anyone who's rational will agree with me and drop their weird ideas about reality and their weird goals that are not aligned with my goals and they'll agree to do what I want to do. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know. I feel a little pessimistic. <laughs> okay, I hope this has been entertaining and insightful and helpful. Um, this is the end of the code lectures and next up is Naomi Sheeman's uh, paper called Feminist Epistemology. It goes over a lot of the same concepts, different perspectives on these uh, concepts, different arguments.